In this video, I'm going to go over the process for acoustically isolating my space. My name is Peter Rain, and this is my home studio for voiceover and music. I'm going to show you best I can how I built it, why I built it, what I learned and how it could potentially help you in your own setups, and what makes it different from your typical voiceover booth. Welcome to part two, isolation. To recap, sound isolation prevents outside noise from entering your space, as opposed to acoustic treatment, which is making the space itself sound great for the type of recording or listening you intend to do with it. Isolation is primarily working with mass, making sure there is enough mass between you and the sound source, air, making sure there's no unwanted airflow that sound waves can travel on, and distance you can place between yourself and the sound you don't want to hear. First of all, let's talk about the space I'm working with, because that had a large impact on the isolation needed. This room is on the second story of a relatively small, somewhat awkwardly shaped suburban house. It is in the corner, facing the street above the garage. The house is in a suburban neighborhood, not too far from the local high school, but not adjacent to any major cities or highways. My partner and I live here with our dog, two cats, fish tanks, and no kids. I know pretty good start. Not everyone has those luxuries, but even if you're trying to record in a crowded space in a city, there might still be a trick or two here that could be helpful. The first thing I did after clearing out the room was take some measurements. I used a mini DSP UMIK-1 measurement microphone, which connects to a computer software to provide high detailed readings of all the frequencies that I do not understand. I actually took readings not only of the room, but the hallway to the room, the center of the house where the AC is pretty loud, and outside in front of the garage. John Brandt, who is a world-renowned acoustician and designed my studio, took the readings to get started on his designs. He also used those readings to help me determine the isolation I would need to be effective. The biggest question, and the one that would drastically affect the building time, cost, and general headache, was if I needed to insulate the inner walls. Being on the corner of the house, the outside walls are insulated, but the ones facing in are not. One is adjacent to the master bathroom, and the other is shared with the guest bedroom. If the house in general was too loud, I might need to take down drywall into the walls, fill it with insulation, and put the drywall back up. Again, this is focusing on mass part of the isolation. Fortunately, the environment inside was quiet enough that the isolation treatment we had planned would be sufficient. That was a big relief. So what does need to be done? Let's take a look at all the weak points in the room where sound is most likely to enter from. The most obvious ones are the door and the window. They are much thinner than the walls and anywhere air can go, so can sound so those cracks around the door are a big problem. The other obvious concern are the vents. There's an air vent in the floor connected to our heating and cooling system, and one over the door leading into the hallway that was put there to allow for better airflow last year. Now, the parts we don't think of and was fascinating to learn about. When drywall is installed, it often doesn't go all the way down to the flooring. There's usually a small gap there, covered up by your trim, baseboard, or molding, or whatever you want to call it, that tiny inconsistency is a place where sound can more easily travel, as well as potentially air. So that needs to be dealt with. Finally, the electrical outlets. They're full of holes and are an easy place for air to travel in and out of a room, and therefore sound. According to John, it's pretty startling the difference in sound leakage an untreated outlet can have. Now, this was done with the intention of making the full room the studio. However, if you are in a walk-in closet, a fancy portable booth like a whisper room or studio bricks, or even a PVC and movie blanket fort, applying some of these techniques to the larger room your booth is located in could seriously bring your noise floor down. One trick in particular, later on in this video, is so easy, cheap, and effective, everyone should do it. So let's get started. Small stuff first. Take off the trim, fill the gap, and seal it. We did have to crack through some thick paint to get the trim off, but it'll be mostly covered and we can repaint if needed. So not a big deal. The gap was a bit bigger than expected. So we got some expanding foam to fill it up. Pretty easy, just spray, let it cure overnight 
then go through with a knife or wide screwdriver and knock off all the extra. Pro tip, if you're doing this and have carpet, pull up the carpet first. Don't do what I did. Getting the foam off the wall was easy, but getting it out of the carpet was a nightmare. After the foam cured, I simply ran along and sealed it in with some caulk. The key is to get caulk that is flexible. Acoustic caulk works, but is a bit pricey. On John's recommendation, I use Sashko Big Stretch Caulk. Not too expensive and easy to find. The caulk has to stretch, because houses shift, expand, and contract in heat and cold, and generally move. Your house is alive. No. But it will move a little bit, and normal caulking will crack and open up an airway. And again, our goal is to get everything as airtight as possible. For the outlets, it's actually pretty easy. You just need some putty pads. They're generally for fireproofing, cost five to six bucks a piece, and not too hard to install. If you actually have access to the back of the electrical box the outlet is installed in, you can just put it over the back, or you can do what I did and tuck it into the back of the box from the front. Just make sure the breaker is off when you're doing this so you don't electrocute yourself. During this time, we also took down the ceiling fan, sealed up that box entirely since it wasn't needed, and got the electrical all set up. Huge thanks to my partner's dad, who was much better at wiring than I am and was able to do the heavy lifting on this step. The switches that originally ran to the fan were rewired to two boxes on the ceiling by the door, out of the way of all the panels. One box was for the track lighting, and the other was a standard outlet on the ceiling to run my LED strips. The third switch that was originally a fader was replaced by a standard switch. I could have just taken that switch out altogether, but I decided to keep it so I could just flip one switch on my way in to record that would connect to my power strip that runs all my recording equipment. Small quality of life thing that saves me a whopping three seconds of bending down to turn on a power channel. But figured since I've got it, might as well use it. After the outlet covers were put back in place with the putty inside, I went along the edges and sealed them in with more caulking. That was probably excessive, but it didn't take very long or much of the actual big stretch, so I figured why not. Next, the window. This is one of the larger areas where sound gets in from outside. The plan is to get a single, large piece of laminated glass to create a sort of plug that will be framed and fit inside the windowsill in front of the window. This is one of the most expensive parts of my build. However, the current window is already scheduled to be replaced, and there's a chance that that process may somewhat alter the dimensions of my windowsill, so that's gonna have to wait for now. For now, I've just filled the window with pink R15 insulation to seal it, and it's working wonders. Honestly, better than I expected, considering how poor the current window is. If you have a space with a window you want to record in, but outside noise is a problem, and you don't mind covering the window, this is a fairly cheap, quick, and very effective solution. For example, it's pretty dang windy outside, and I'm pretty sure there was a parade today, and I've got none of it coming through my window. Speaking of cheap, quick, and effective, let's talk about the trick everyone should do. Let's talk about the door. So many sound issues happen around the door. The first thing I did was replace the door, which was hollow, with a solid core door. We had to plane and sand down the door frame and get a new doorknob to get it to fit just right. I also installed a taller threshold that would cover the bottom of the door for the next step. Here's the sound isolation trick every voice actor should do in their studio or booth. Seal your door. Seal the door to the room your studio is in. All you do is run a line of window or car weather stripping along the sides of your door frame. If you have a way to seal the bottom of the door, do that too, but at least get the sides. See how much of a gap there is, and use that to gauge the size of strip you need. The one you want is shaped like a D. Looks a little like this. It's 10 to 15 bucks, completely removable if you're in an apartment, and works wonders. There are more intense and more permanent ways to get your door isolation up, as the strips do wear down over time and may need to be replaced. However, in my opinion, in terms of money and time invested, compared with the amount of noise reduction you get, I don't think there's a single isolation technique more efficient than this. Seal your door. Seriously. The taller threshold I installed allowed me to put the weather stripping on that threshold to create a complete seal around the door frame. I had to make some small adjustments here and there, adding some additional strips to certain parts of the door itself, 
where gaps were still present, but with some trial and error, my door completely seals. I also recommend doing this step at night. What you do is you turn on bright lights inside the room you're trying to treat and keep it dark on the other side. Slowly close the door and anywhere you see light, that's a gap you need to fill. The last step is controlling the airflow we do want. Now that everything else is sealed tight, we only have air coming in through the floor vent and out the vent above the door. What we do is build what's called a baffle box to essentially treat the air as it moves into the studio, removing the sound, but keeping the airflow. I don't think I need to explain why it's important to have airflow in your studio. A baffle box is a little maze that air has to travel through where all sound hits absorption points and is stopped, but the air keeps going. I built this with MDF, medium density fiberboard, cut to specs sent by John Brandt, with a lot of help from my family friend Joel, who was able to correct some cuts that I had made incorrectly on my first attempt. The maze was created, lined with that rigid duct liner, plenum specifically, so it is designed to be breathable, that's also important, and closed it up. Vents were installed on the openings, and they were ready to go. It sounds easy, but it definitely took some doing to get everything to fit perfectly with the double layer of MDF board. The pieces were all attached together and sealed with wood glue and brad nails. The one for the floor vent is actually heavy enough to just sit on top of the vent and seal it down without any kind of attachment needed. The change in sound from the vent was remarkable. It immediately went from pretty noticeable down to nothing. The one above the door was a little more tricky. Huge thanks to my friend Jake for helping me out with this step. The top of the box happened to line up nicely with a stud, which helped a ton. So it rested slightly on the door flame, locked into place with some L brackets into the studs, and was reinforced by a pair of chains also running into studs. I was originally pretty concerned about this step because of how heavy the boxes were, but man, that thing is locked in place. I'll definitely get around to painting those baffle boxes one day, but for now, they are effective, and that's what I need. And that's it for part two. The room is isolated and ready for treatment. As you can tell, there were some specifics that only made sense for me, as well as some lack of work I could get away with, especially since I'm only trying to keep sound from coming in, not from coming out. That being said, if you found any of this interesting or of use in any way, please share it around, let me know in the comments your thoughts and ideas, and if you have any questions or if anything I said didn't make sense, please let me know and I'll try and address it in a future video. In the next video, we'll dive into the acoustic treatment process, what I did, what I built, and what might be of use to you. Thanks again for watching, take care, bye.